Mad Fulton, The End of an Error. After more than 550 issues and 67 years, Mad Magazine is coming to an end, and we're talking exclusively with members of the usual gang of idiots. Today, former Mad Senior Editor Charlie Kadu gives us his thoughts and the inside story of Mad Magazine. I'm David Levin, and this is Pop Goes the Culture. David Levin, and welcome to Pop Goes the Culture. And uh, we've been talking about uh, Mad Magazine and Memories of Mad. Right now, I have with me a good friend of Pop Goes the Culture and a uh, former editor of Mad Magazine, Mr. Charlie Kadu. Charlie, welcome to the show. Hi, Dave. How are you? I am good. And um, how are you, Charlie? Uh, the last couple of months have been, uh, been uh, quite the... Uh, Emotional roller coaster ride for Mad Magazine, but your journey started about about thirty five years ago. That true with Mad? Absolutely, that is what happened. Uh, I mean, we knew each other uh, even before I was associated with Mad. True enough. So we go way back. Um, but yeah, uh, I and my uh, writing partner Joe Rayola, uh, who go back even further. Than you and I uh, saw an ad uh, that said that Mad Magazine was looking for writers, and we answered it. Really? And, so you're, uh, you're kind of like you're kind of like uh, Elton John and Bernie Taupin, then I guess. <laughs> yes, we we call ourselves the Lennon and McCartney of comedy. <laughs> uh, that, that's uh, Stan Lennon and uh, and Sherman McCartney. Um, <laughs> But, uh, yeah, we answered an ad. We were doing some radio work at the time, and we sent in a, uh, a cassette of some of our radio bits. Uh, John Ficarra, uh responded. He said, hey, good stuff. What can you do for us? Hey. So we uh, started writing and sent some stuff in, and we started selling from our first batch, uh, which was a good, good thing. That's amazing. I, normally, I, I, normally I hear that, that people don't sell in their first, uh, with their first go-round in Mad Magazine. Uh, yeah, lots of people, including John himself, who, who told us he submitted, oh gosh, a couple of dozen times before uh, he was finally able to make a sale. Um, I mean, just as a side note, I think when two people are writing together, it can be good uh, because we were editing each other even before we sent anything in. Uh, and I thought that probably helped us in the long run. Uh, anyway, we just happened to be in the right place at the right time. Uh, longtime editor Al Feldstein was retiring after 30 years, and John and Nick Meglin, uh, who had been with MAD practically from the beginning, uh, were elevated to co-editors, mm -hmm. and they needed someone to fill in. Originally, they were going to hire one person, find and hire one person, uh, but Joe and I filled the bill. So we started at the beginning of 1985, and we were with Mad until the end of 2017. Wow. So I'm imagining that uh, because of your longevity, that the benefits must have been really good. Well, benefits in terms of what? A retirement package? <laughs> well, health benefits and retirement and dental. And I mean, you know, you stay with a company for 33 some odd years. That's a long time. That's true. Uh, there was a time when most people did that. Probably our parents and grandparents uh, tended to do that sort of thing. Um, it was, uh, what can I say? It was a good fit. So, okay. Uh, so what was it like go, get, getting, you know, we're talking, we're talking uh, mid eighties now. Um, m most of the original gang of idiots is still sort of in place. Uh, as, as Sam Viviano said, for the most part, it had been a closed, um, it had been a closed shop for a long time. Al was leaving, and uh, and Nick and John were were becoming editors. And so now you're coming into this thing. Bill Gaines is still there. You're still at 485 Madison Avenue. So tell us what that that era was was like to sort of be there every single day and be part of Mad and to get inculcated into uh, that the the Mad uh, milieu, as it were. It is a incredible feeling. 
and an incredible experience as someone who started reading Mad when I discovered it about age 11. What was your first issue? Uh, Do you remember the first issue you ever saw? Well, I remember seeing uh, beforehand a couple of the earlier issues, like the issue where Alfred was the organ grinder and, and King Kong was the monkey. Uh-huh. Uh, or the special uh, race issue where, where Alfred was depicted as all the different races of man on the cover. I remember seeing those and thinking they were funny. The first issue I actually purchased was, I think, issue 115 uh, at the end of 1966. Um, it had the Star Trek satire in uh-huh. it. Uh, and the, the unusual thing about it is this is just one of those weird coincidental stories. The first issue of Mad I ever purchased did not have Alfred E. Newman on the cover. Interesting. Uh, it was the, uh, the takeoff of the Avis button. We mm-hmm. don't try very hard. <laughs> and the coincidence was the very first issue that uh, Joe and I had an article published in was issue 254, the special rock issue which again did not have Alfred E. Newman on the cover. <laughs> um, I don't know what a tarot card reader or a psychic would make of that, but, uh, but it's just something that happened. One of those. Uh, anyway, from, from, from having read mad a long time ago and never thinking, never even really considering writing for it. Uh, when we started sending stuff in and they started buying and publishing it, and we actually visited the offices, it, it really was like uh, a, a visit to, to something out of a, a madman, madman kind of world. Uh, on Madison Avenue, we walked in. I think we were waiting in the lobby for John to come out and, and get us. And uh, who comes out into the lobby and goes out to go to the restroom, <laughs> apparently, is William M. Gaines. Who you recognize? He just walks by and does a little, little... Hello, nod, and and goes by, and and I look at John and say, "That's William M. Gaines." Uh, it was, you know, I I I can't speak for Joe, but I I was really there as a fanboy, right? Um, and and meeting John and Nick and Al Feldstein, who was still there. It was 1984. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and getting a tour of the offices, it was was just. Wow, I might as well have been 11 years old. Right, exactly. Uh, uh, checking this place out. Uh, but they're talking to us. Hey, we're, we're contributing writers now. <laughs> you know, it, it, was a, it was a weird uh, uh, little double thing going on there. Anyway, uh, it, it was just fantastic having a chance to meet and then to actually work with and collaborate with all these mad greats like Al Jaffe and, and Dick Bartolo and George Woodbridge and Paul Coker, uh, it was uh, amazing and more Drucker, obviously. Uh, wow. That is quite amazing. I, 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 you know, you, you still sound like a fanboy even now after all these years. Oh, yeah. Uh Having worked with, I, I'm I'm not jaded. Uh, for the most part, everyone I met and encountered was was gracious and friendly and welcoming, uh, and and for the most part, kind of of what I would have imagined. Um, it, it was a great great group of people. And I have uh, to imagine, I you know, you were always. From, from you know, and you mentioned we've been friends for a long time, and you were always an aspiring, or you were a comedy writer. I mean, if you're actually writing comedy, I guess you're not aspiring, but aspiring successful comedy writer. Um, but I have to imagine that there was a tremendous, it was a tremendous opportunity as a learning experience. Uh, you know, can you share some of the lessons you learned in those early days, or even in the later days? That, uh, uh, about comedy and what you learned as a writer? Well, I'll tell you, when, when I found out there was an opportunity that I could write for Mad, I did two things. First, I went and bought every current Mad product I could find at the newsstand and was surprised 
to see how many of the same team were still there uh, and how what what later uh, we learned was the mad voice was still quite intact and very strong. And uh, the other thing I did was I went to my uh, grandparents' house and went into the closet and pulled out this box that had all the mad magazines I had bought as a kid, uh, you know, from roughly the ages of of, uh, 11 to 17, and started reading them, going through them in order. And obviously now not having read these issues in... I don't know, 10 years or longer, uh, suddenly seeing lots of other things that were in the articles that I hadn't noticed when I was a kid. Uh, references and, and tone and um, the way the jokes were structured. Uh, I was kind of getting under the hood in a, in a certain way. And later, working uh, on other writers' scripts uh, and realizing that that what you uh, see in the pages of Mad isn't what the writers submit. It's not just a, they, you know the writer just doesn't drop off a script and then we go into the room and Xerox it and publish it. Uh, there's an editorial process. Uh, not every writer writes a perfect script, so we would be taking out jokes and rewriting jokes and adding jokes and, 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 and working with John and Nick, uh, and seeing how they did it. And, uh, and then, you know, bringing our own sensibilities to it, uh, because mad Joe was such a mad fan as well. We had just really, you know, inhaled it. It was, it was in our DNA and we kind of got it. Uh, we knew the mad voice from the moment we walked in the door. Um, and it was just very interesting seeing what what the process was, how the sausage is made. You were you were uh, the mad voice. I mean, even even you know even then. I mean, there's just it was such a great fit uh, early on for you guys, wasn't it? Oh yeah, yeah. I think we had been uh, expressing the mad voice through our work, through what we were doing even before Mad, and didn't realize it. Uh, I mean, so many people are writing and talking about how how mad influenced our popular culture uh, so much. Everything from, you know, TV and movies to advertising uh, and, and, and publishing uh, <clears throat> that we were doing it, didn't even know it. <laughs> so you guys were influencing the popular culture while the popular culture was kind of influencing you guys as well it was kind of a big circle jerk well i'd rather not use that terminology <laughs> well what terminology but but uh but yeah i mean that was a very interesting thing as our our culture became more coarse and a little more profane uh we had to sometimes sit down and say well do we want to say this do we want to show that um, and ultimately I think our guide was that, that we reflect the culture, as Nick used to say, we reflect the culture through a funhouse mirror. And, uh, so we started doing things gradually, uh, on, on an as needed basis. Um, the, uh, you know, using using certain words, making reference to certain bodily functions uh, or sexual activities. Uh, the whole Bill Clinton, Monica Lewinsky situation really Presented all made us and, and the media as well have to, uh, uh, you know, take a whole different view on, on what we say and publish. What was, can you give, give an example of something? Okay, so Bill Clinton, can you give an example of something where you sort of like, Somebody submitted something and you said, oh, are we going to go with this? Are we crossing this line? Are we not crossing that line? When, you know, when did you guys sort of get to those lines? When did you decide to cross it? When did you decide to not cross? I'll tell you, I cannot think of a specific example right now. Uh, it had a lot to do with uh, terminology. Uh, and, and we would come up with, 
you know, we'd make decisions on on what we were going to say. We we decided early on at some point we were going to use the slang term junk to refer to uh, a guy's parts. You mean his junk? Uh, yes. Uh, and, and, and some of this may sound ridiculous to people uh, uh, listening to this now through a 2019 lens. Uh, but back in the late 80s, this was kind of new stuff we were dealing with. Uh, and and uh, the, what's very funny was when I was reading Mad as a Kid, uh, Serge, there had been a Sergio Aragonis cartoon published about a uh, – no, no, it was Paul Coker who drew it. I'm sorry. I think Sergio may have written it mm-hmm. about a guy who's out in his boat and he catches a mermaid. And he brings the mermaid home and he's thinking, wow, you know, the news is going to want to know about this. And, and, and he's on the phone. Uh, and then suddenly the news media shows up with the cameras and reporters and everything. And he goes in and his uh, elderly mother has already put the mermaid in the pot and is cooking it. <laughs> Um, but the funny thing was when Paul Coker drew the cartoon, he put nipples on the mermaid, uh, which seemed, you know, normal, of course, I guess. And there were at that time and funny and f- comically later, years later, when we reprinted it in a uh, super special, we were getting letters of protest saying, how dare we do this gross sexual uh, a depiction in our pages of nipple and um you know we thought well it's it's just a couple of little dots drawn with a pen on on a uh, a mythical creature and it was getting people upset hey look they're, they're they they just cast a, an african american woman as ariel in the uh, in the walt disney live action little mermaid and people are all upset that, that, that yeah and people are going crazy with that I, I i saw something this morning i don't know if it's true or not unfortunately when we see things posted nowadays we have to ask is this real or is this not real right um I, I and I have no idea. It was it was an article. It didn't seem to be from from a a phony spoof kind of website uh, that said that they've cast the, uh, the next James Bond. Have, did you see this article? No, what did they say? I haven't oh, seen it. Oh, they, 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 the 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 article named an actress and said uh, it, it was it, it was an African American uh, woman who was going to be the next James Bond. <laughs> Okay. Now I don't I, I don't know if there's any truth to that or not. It could be uh, completely phony. I, I didn't it. recognize the name of the website, but it wasn't the Onion and it wasn't uh, you know Goofo.com or something. I'm not offended that uh, that it's uh, African or a woman. I'm offended that it's not a, a, a British person. Um. Well, maybe she's African British. Okay. Well, then that then that's okay. Then that's fine. That's, I don't know. Well, look, Sean Connery was Scottish. <laughs> well, that's okay. You know, that's fine. That's just fine. That's just fine. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, you watch The Simpsons and you think, you know, okay, the, Bart goes to visit the mad offices. People have seen that clip a million times uh, with the uh, with the older lady sitting at the desk. And then as soon as he walks out the door, you know, it's chaos in the mad offices, uh, but the mad offices were not really chaotic. I mean, they, they were pretty sedate. I, I had the dubious privilege of sitting in on a lot of uh, mad uh, uh, creative meetings or story conferences, and there was a lot of sitting around with, uh, with very serious faces as, as people were trying to come up with cover ideas or funnier ideas or decide if this joke was funny or that joke was funny or this joke wasn't funny. Um, and, of course, there's the famous uh, 60 Minutes uh, um, story that was done with Morley Safer 30-some-odd years ago where everybody's sort of sitting around not saying a word during one of these creative meetings. Um what was it like in the mad offices on a on a regular basis? Did it ever explode into lunacy, or was it pretty much just sort of business as usual every single day? You had to be there on the right day. <laughs> which, uh, yeah, which was 60 minutes, was obviously not. 
Well, that's true. I guess we all got uh, a camera fright that day. Uh, it was uh, a uh, it would go back and forth. Sometimes we would spend uh, a week or more on almost daily uh, day long conferences trying to think of the next cover. Mm-hmm. Uh, cover ideas aren't simple. Yeah. Uh, well, we're not just putting uh, the face of a celebrity uh, on, on the cover. Uh, we like there to be a gag. Mm-hmm. And after doing 300 plus issues, then 400 plus issues, and then 500 plus issues, uh, it gets a little more difficult each time to be fresh. So, uh, and we took it seriously. I mean, we would, obviously, there were there were periods of time when we were joking around and making fun of each other's ideas. Right. And, and someone really trying to do a hard sell on their idea and, uh, uh, you know, and then coming up with crazy, ridiculous ideas that, that we never do. Um, and that in part is, is why in, in our feature, the Fundalini pages, we came up with uh, the cover we didn't use, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, because there were some covers that were funny, but they just wouldn't make a good, good cover. So right. we, we created that feature. Ray Alma drew a lot of those. Uh, and it was a good way to uh, to use the stuff That's funny. Uh, that we generated. That's awesome. But there were there were there were times when when it would explode into to hilarity, and there were were times when uh, it was uh, uh, as as someone referred to it as a comedy coal mine, uh, <laughs> because by the end at the end of the day, the work had to be done. Did uh, so, did did did. Did uh, Donald Trump make things easier or harder for you when he came into office? It's a uh, it's a mixed bag. I think we would have done just as fine uh, with the president, Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. Certainly the country would have done better, (laughs) but um, it really doesn't matter we 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 uh uh never said oh we hope this happens because we'll be able to write stuff about it or funnier stuff about it uh as i said earlier we reflected the culture so whatever the culture served up we put it into our our blender and and mix it up and serve it back to them right um you know it had to be challenging over the years uh at Mad, as as other, well, first of all, as people who were influenced by Mad ended up being out there and creating shows. You know, it was great to have a Stephen Colbert out there, and great to have a Weird Al Yankovic out there, and great to have people who sort of were inspired by what Mad Mad was doing. And now all of a sudden, Mad is competing with the people that it helped train, or the people who were inspired by it. Um, and Mad is still a magazine and trying to do a little bit of, you know, sort of uh, put some stuff online. But now you're competing with a whole bunch of other stuff, including daily uh, memes and things of that nature, where everybody in the universe thinks that they can do what you guys did. Uh, I have to imagine it became harder to sort of keep up with, with, with the pace and the way things were changing in the universe and to still say the have the relevance that Mad had always had. What what kind of challenge was that over the years? I mean, you watched the evolution of that as as Mad went from a from a print oriented culture to a uh, social media oriented culture. It didn't only go from a uh, print culture to a an electronic or digital media culture. When Mad started, it was a black and white culture. Yes. Yeah. Uh, newspapers uh, were black and white, magazines were black and white, television was black and white. Um, And then as everything converted to color, MAD started to look weird by still being black and white. That's why we pushed and eventually, uh, over a long period of time, converted to color. Uh, We had to. MAD used to publish parodies of magazines and magazine ads. Uh, I mean, magazine ads were, were probably more dominant in, in some ways than uh, 
television commercials of, of that time of the late 50s and, and uh, 60s. Yeah. So we found lots of material, uh, not that I was mad at that time, in, in parodying magazine ads and magazine campaigns. That doesn't happen anymore. So we're not parodying newspapers. We're not parodying magazines. We got to the point where now we were parodying catalogs Mm -hmm. and actually uh, parodying uh, coupon inserts uh, (laughs) that people would get in the mail. Uh, And and we've also parodied websites on the printed page. Um, That's where where the, uh, the culture is gone. So we have the um, we have whatever constraints the printed page uh, presents to us, mm-hmm. but uh, it can still be used. It can still uh, uh, mock, make fun of, parody, and lampoon whatever's out there. Right. Absolutely. Well, you were you were also dealing with the fact, I guess that that. You know, Mad had to be printed and it took a little while and other things were a little bit more immediate, immediate, you know, so you guys did put a lot of social media stuff up. I think you were putting up uh, material at least once a day um, at one point. Is that is that correct? Um, On our website and blog, uh, we did do a feature called The Idiotical, which was a Monday through Friday post of uh we tried to make it original we would come in in the morning see what a big story was or what was breaking and uh, and uh, try to produce something on it that was posted that afternoon so yeah the uh you know they talk about a 24-hour news cycle nowadays and and i pointed out well now there's a 24-hour joke cycle yeah uh, that that stuff that happened that day is now being talked about that night not just on one talk show, The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, uh, but there's six or more programs that are that are all uh, mining the day's events for material. Right. And it, uh, it, it it's it's really you know the instant comedy uh, generator we have now called called the internet. Uh, whenever someone came up with an idea. After sometime in the 2000s, our first response was, let's Google it <laughs> and, and let's see if someone else has already done it. So that adds an extra whole extra layer of, of, of stress, I would imagine, to and, and competition to everything that you guys were doing. Well, I mean, it used to be if somebody submitted an idea for, for a, a cartoon uh, and one of us remembered, wait a minute, you know. The New Yorker ran that cartoon, you know, or or, or Playboy or, uh, you know, wait a minute. I was watching David Letterman the other day and he made that same joke. Uh, It became, has anyone else on the web done uh, what we want to do visually? Uh, So, yeah, it it was just another layer of research uh, that we'd have to do. Now, if someone did an idea and they just didn't, it, it was nothing at all like what we were planning on doing. You know, it, it was really more just uh, using the same subject matter rather than doing the same joke. Uh, we felt, well, okay, we can do what we want to do. We're going to do our take on it. Fair Certainly, game. You know, right. Jimmy Fallon and Conan O'Brien will tell tell a joke about Ivanka Trump, but they're different jokes. Right, 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 right. So the last couple of years, I'm sure, were very challenging. I know that um, that sales of all magazines were sort of uh, an issue. I know I've you know spoken to a few people about Mad leaving New York and and uh, the editor sort of at once uh, saying, yeah, we're going to stay in New York. And Mad ultimately uh, moved out to Burbank um, and was rebooted by uh, by a whole new crew just about. Um, now, Mad is uh, that well, you know, nothing goes away forever, and Mad, I guess, is too big a uh, a brand for for Warner Brothers to retire forever. But do you have any thoughts, any feelings as um, 
as Matt is ceasing publication of original material for the first time in, since, I guess, the beginning of publication way, way back in the, in the 50s. Right. 67 years is the number that everyone is, uh, you know, bandying about. Uh, it is a sad occasion, whether or not this is, in fact, what actually happens. We don't know yet. Uh, DC Comics or Warner Brothers Entertainment, n neither entity has made or issued any official statement uh everything that's been going around and, and what propelled dozens and dozens of of uh newspaper articles and magazine pieces and and blog posts uh was based on something that was sent to the contributors so we don't know what's going to happen yet for sure um Mad has uh, uh, Mad hasn't done lots of reprints recently. I mean, gee, we used to put out four to six uh, reprint specials every year, right? Uh, so there's certainly a lot of material that can be uh, mined and and presented and reprinted for the very first time, right? Uh, otherwise, well, I don't know. I would say it's it's uh, the door isn't closed, the coffin isn't shut. The autopsy papers haven't been signed. Alfred's ears. I don't know what. Alfred's ears are still sticking out of the coffin, so you know. <laughs> really, I I I'm not sure. Matt has gone the way of the uh, the VHS cassette yet. Uh, yeah, I think I I I have a feeling you're you're. Uh, you're right. You know, Al Jaffe would 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 probably say that Matt has been folding for years, but that's just me. Um, uh, any thoughts? What are you What are you doing these days? Uh, now that Matt is uh, gone, you taking a little time off? You doing a little writing? What's uh... I, I I have taken time off, and I am doing writing. I'm I'm working on a uh, a project that is uh, still under wraps. One thing that I will mention, I don't know uh, when people will be seeing this, uh, I in fact do have a uh, piece in the next issue of MAD. Oh, very nice. Uh, which will be on the stands in August of 2019. Okay. Uh, satire of the uh, the program, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. One of my favorites. I'm looking for who's drawing it, do you know? Yes, one of your friends and mine, Sam Viviano. Never heard of him. <laughs> uh, we just finished speaking to Sam, so that I'm glad to I'm glad to hear that you guys are uh, able to team up a little bit. That that's good. That's good news. Yes, um, it was a great idea. Yeah. Uh, well, Charlie, uh, can people uh, follow you on Twitter or get in touch with you if they want to uh, if they want to uh, follow you or see what's going on with you? Well, my, uh, my public Facebook page is uh, Charlie Cadu, spelled K-A-D-O-O. -O. Uh, that's probably the best place to find me if you want to uh, hear some of my uh, outlandish opinions and attempts at jokes. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you, you could, could, be a, could be able to make a living doing that. From this, you make a living. Ha, 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 ha. Charlie, now I'm trying to make uh, uh, now I'm trying to make a, uh, a semi-retirement. Well, semi-retirement is 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 always uh, a good thing, and uh, and uh, but, but you know, you're Charlie, funny. You're always been funny, and uh, and I know you're going to be funny in the future. So hopefully you'll. I'm, I'm willing to entertain offers. Um, you heard it here first, folks. Charlie K. Dude, thanks for coming on to Pop Goes the Culture. Really great to great talk to you. Great being with you, Dave. Thank you. Hey, it's David Levin. If you like Pop Goes the Culture and want to see more of it, don't forget to subscribe, click on one of these links, and please help us out on Patreon so that we can keep bringing more Pop Goes the Culture episodes to you.